first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming and attending with us on Zoom and people who are here in person. We have a great event today. We have a bunch of great speakers that I'm going to be happy to introduce. Uh, first off, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Isaac Ziskin. I'm one of the senior partners at Diamond and Diamond. I'm also one of the managers of the real estate and civil litigation department. Uh, by way of background, my, uh, my experience is in uh, litigation for the past 16 years now. Um, when we started Diamond and Diamond about 10 years ago, obviously you all know us uh, from radio ads and TV as a, as a personal injury firm. Uh, over the last six years, our civil litigation, uh, real estate department, and, and corporate department has grown immensely. We're now one of the biggest real estate transactional firms in Canada in terms of volume. We have offices in Ontario and Alberta, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later on today. I'm really excited to have uh, a bunch of great speakers here today. Um, as you know, on the invitation, who's, who's speaking, I'm gonna introduce them one by one and they're gonna come up and, and share their thoughts with, with you. One of the things that obviously we wanna talk about is in the past 15 years, we've had a great real estate market. The, uh, nice to see you too, Esty, thank you. Uh, we've had a great real estate market. Uh, our real estate prices in terms of homes have gone up. Uh, we've been able to refinance pretty easily given the appraisals have been going up year over year. Obviously after COVID things have changed. We now see the, the big rates and in interest rate hikes, which is affecting people. It's affecting the ability to refinance homes on the, on the A side in terms of, of refinancing as well as the B and C side. What we're also seeing is a slowdown in the real estate market in terms of housing prices. So what does that mean for everybody? You know, a little bit, I always said it, I go, when the market is hot and everyone is doing well, it's very easy to get business. Now we have to be a little bit more creative. We have to be a little bit more on the ball and come up with new ideas. And I think a lot of the presenters here today who I'm proud to, to sit beside are going to give us some great insights and ideas in terms of what we can do over the next few years while we kind of battle through this uh, interest rate adjustment as well as this market slowdown. So without further ado, I want to uh, introduce our first presenter, uh, Jim Turgulis, and I apologize if I've uh, mispronounced it. All right. Uh, Jim is the president of Verico Advent Mortgage Services. He's been a mortgage broker for over 20 years. He's been ranked number one mortgage broker across Canada from a dollar volume perspective. And his businesses and services of clients, he services clients of financial planners, lawyers, and many corporate institutions. Uh, he also runs a mortgage coaching practice where he coaches mortgage agents to help them elevate their business. So without further ado, our first presenter, Jim. All right. Thank you, Isaac. And all right, um, I'm here to talk about uh, what Isaac alluded to is how to find business within your business um, through what I call data mining. So pretty timely conversation uh, for our industry today. Uh, quickly, I'll walk through who I am uh, what is data mining? Um, why do we do this? What's in it for us? What's in it for our clients? What's in it for our partners, our realty partners, our uh, legal partners, our financial planning partners? What are some success criteria you need to meet for this to work? And finally, what are some examples of success that we've seen in the past doing data mining? All right, so um, as Isaac mentioned, I've been a broker for 20 years. Um, have been ranked the top broker uh, consistently year in, year out, do about $450 odd million dollars worth of mortgages. Why am I mentioning this? Not trying to be braggadocious. It's uh, my success is a direct function of what we're talking about today, data mining. Two thirds of my business comes from this exercise, about 500 transactions per year. And I'm also a mortgage coach. So I'm helping other mortgage brokers uh, elevate their game, um, how to succeed in this business. So I do some of that as well. Okay, enough about me. Um, what is data mining? Quite simply, it's a fancy way of saying, looking into your database to find opportunities from your past clients. We've broken it up into three distinct categories, what we call POP, and POP stands for pain points, opportunities, and protection of a client. So when we do a mortgage for a client, we actually take note of all the specific pain points our clients have today and might have on a going forward basis. And we go into that information post-close over the next 15, 20 years for that client, 
find those pain points and solve them for the client. There's many. Um, we also look at our second bucket, what we call opportunities, which is we look to find opportunities to save our clients money. Whether that means locking down a good rate, whether that means extracting some capital, whatever it means for that client. We capture our client's data so we can actually go back and solve this problem. The third P in POP is protecting, protecting our clients. You know, we have to protect our clients from themselves, of course, from the product and from the market. And today's a great example of how we protect the clients. We'll walk through that. So through this POP exercise that we do for our clients, we use about 10, uh, 12 to 13 examples that we do for our clients to keep them coming back. Now, it's not a CRM. We do have a CRM, right? Most of us have CRMs. You should have a CRM. You know, our CRM will touch our clients 50 times over the course of a five-year period. Things like, hey, happy birthday, happy mortgage anniversary, happy Halloween, all meaningless stuff, which the only thing it does for us is keeps us top of mind. That's it. That's all it does. It's kind of 2000s, right? So this data mining exercise actually provides what I call value-added, actionable communication to our client. And it works extremely high take up on this stuff. So it's not a CRM, it goes beyond the CRM. Why do we do this? Well, clearly it's low hanging fruit. Who doesn't want more business today, right? Um, it's low hanging fruit and it's easy, easy business. It's easy because your client knows you, you've done their mortgage, you don't have to sell them again. And you're coming at them with a value added approach. Hey, let me save you this. Hey, let me protect you here, whatever it may be. But it's low hanging fruit, it's easy. Unlike purchases, this business does not have the stresses we have with purchases. Like, how many brokers here love condition of financing? Like, who needs to pull their hair out? So, none of that happens. Um, there's only one side to this deal, there's not two sides, there's not a buyer and a seller. This deal is not going to fall apart, appraisal is not going to come in light. So, when you work on this type of business, it actually closes. And finally, as a broker, my biggest pain point in a purchase is the down payment. Clients never listen, right? They're going to give you three or four different accounts, money moving back and forth for the last four months, and you're going to be an architect trying to figure out how to piece this together. This stuff doesn't exist. Now, we do this also because our clients expect it. When we win a client over, it's not for today's deal. It's not for the term. It's for the next 20 years. So our clients expect us to do this work for them, and we do it. You also want to do this today because there's excess capacity. My business is down about 30% in the month of October versus last October. I'm sure most of us have some capacity. Good time to do this. And finally, it's a win. It's a triple win, actually. It's a triple win. It's a win for my client. They're getting taken care of. It's a win for me because I'm getting some business. It's also a win for my partner. It's a win for my lawyer partners who now go, we go after their clients with them to help save our clients and protect our clients and remove the pain points of our clients. Same with our realtor clients, um, our retail partners, pardon me, and as well as our financial planning partners. So at the end of the day, by doing this, we create a client for life. Now, to make this work, there's some criteria you gotta follow, right? Info's gotta be good, right? Junk in, junk out. If the information going in is, is not right, you're gonna have terrible results at the back end. So, and we all know as mortgage brokers, when you start a file to when you finish, many things have changed. You gotta make sure the data is correct. Beyond that, you gotta make sure you capture the correct data. A lot of us don't capture the correct data. During the client journey, during the discovery call, we pick up a lot of information that most of us don't even capture and go back to. And this is where the pain points are. So you gotta find a way to capture that data and be able to go back and solve that pain point from the client. It's gotta be easily accessible, right? If it's hard to do, you're not gonna do it. If it's hard to do, you're not gonna let your assistant do it. It's just not gonna work. And it's gotta be simple. So our process is really simple. So if you can envision a spreadsheet with 15,000 clients, and 15,000 clients we've done over the last 20 years, down the bottom, across the top, we've got all these pain points that the clients uh, have told us about that we actually use to run our queries. So I can turn around at any point in time and say, okay, give me everyone who's got a variable of prime minus 40 or worse 
that has a guarantor who bought a, a rental property um, that's got 30% equity. Boom, I've got 200 names um, that I can now easily go after and solve these points for my client. But it's gotta be actionable. So the information and the people we go after, there must be actionable value add. So when we run these queries, if there's no value add, we skip right by them on to the next. And of course you gotta track it. If you don't track it, then you're gonna look silly when your next campaign comes up and you've done this client's mortgage six months ago and you're talking to them again. So, all right, what are some quick examples of what we, what we, what we do here? There's 12 that we have ongoing at any point in time. Um, some of the four are here. So the variable rate strategy, essentially this is an arbitrage opportunity for our clients. It's easy money, free money for the clients. Quite simply, all of us are probably doing this. We sh if not, we should be doing this. And it's something like, you know, show me everyone who's a prime minus 40, who can today be a prime minus one. Here's 60 basis points, three years to go. I just saved this client 20, 200 basis points, right? So on a million dollar mortgage, it's $20,000 savings, 4,000 to get out, easy win for the client, right? I think most of us are probably doing this. Uh, today's market, this early renewal strategy works really, really well. Uh, this falls under my protection of POP. And this um, has saved people a lot of money over the last six months. We all know the banks are going back after our clients six months before renewal. That's, that's kind of their trigger point. We know most brokers go back to their clients to hold the rate four months before renewal. Way too late, way too late. We go back 13 months before, right? 13 months is the actual trigger point where you want to go after your client because that's the point where you can hold that rate for four months and then break that mortgage uh, nine months less a day, which triggers a penalty of three months interest, not the IRD, right? So I can tell you, we've been doing this forever in this past six months. You know, we're, doing, we're closing and have, and have closed files today, clients at 3.2% where their bank's calling with five and a half. So imagine the client from million dollar mortgage that we are holding 3.2 and today they're facing five and a half, they're saving $100,000 over the next five years. It's pretty good, right? Um, but that's a good strategy. Works sometimes, works in a volatile market, upward rate environment, doesn't work so well in a down, downward rate environment, but that's okay. There's other strategies for that. Uh, guarantor removal is one that we love. This is a pain point for clients. You know, when Susie and Joe went and bought a house, they didn't qualify. So they invited mom and dad to be as guarantors. Mom and dad didn't like it. Susie didn't like it, but they had to do it. So we go back to our clients and say, hey, two years have passed, you want to get mom and dad off. What an opportunity to remove this pain point. And I can tell you, going forward, over the next three to four years, given their current market, we're going to see a lot of this. We're going to see a lot of guarantors going on with kids who want to come off three or four years later. And if you're not tracking this, they'll never get at this. Easy to track, easy to get at. Uh, and the final example is what I call capital extraction. Um, two examples here, um, investor clients, right? They buy a property um, and um, let's say it's even a rental property, a new construction. They bought it for 500, they put 100K down, got a 400K mortgage. But when they closed, we knew the value was a million dollars, but we can only get a mortgage for 400 because it's a lower of, right? We all know that. Well, we go back to this client and say, hey, investor client, how would you like to pull 400K out? Get your 100K back, pocket 300 more, buy three more properties, right? We all should be doing this. The key is, are we tracking? Are we tracking in such a way that we can access it pretty easily and go at it pretty, pretty quickly? So those are four examples. We've got about 12 to 13 that we do consistently year in and year out, and they work. Like I said, it's two thirds of my business has always been this stuff, easy business. I'll just end by giving a quote from Richard Branson. A business is simply an idea to make other people's lives better. And that's kind of what we do with our pop, right? Everything that we do is making our clients' lives better. That's it. Hey, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm back. And I'd like to thank Jim for that great presentation. It was really insightful. And I hope uh, everybody uh, took in. I see that there's one... Uh, 
chat issue. Okay. So I was just going to tell the audience at home, if you have any questions, please put it on the chat. We're doing a QA and a period afterwards. And what I'll do is I'll get to the, I'll get to the chat questions afterwards when we do our, our Q and A, this way we can kind of answer based on, on presenter. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our second presenter, Mr. Sean Allen who's the CEO of Matrix Mortgage, and uh, he's also the uh, a private mortgage underwriter. Sean Allen is the founder of Matrix, and it's Canada's number one private lending brokerage with five consecutive Broker of the Year awards. Sean is a highly respected business owner and a community member. He's been indicted to the Scarborough Walk of Fame in September 2022 for his work and dedication in the Scarborough Business Association. In addition to his real estate and mortgage uh, accolades, uh, he also runs a not-for-profit organization called Matrix Cares. He is partners with Scarborough Health Network, MLSC, Nabatia Foundation, and others to provide financial literacy and training. He's a top 100 global influencer and also hosts an annual mayor's lunch with Toronto Mayor John Tory. I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. Sean Allen. So my name's Sean Allen, and I just want to start by saying, if you're not thinking about your clients tomorrow, today might be your last day. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of people get into the mortgage business for the simple fact that they wanna earn a fast buck. They hear that it's easy to make some money, maybe not now because it's a little more challenging to get financing around the place. But at the end of the day, private financing historically has been a place of refuge because there's less documentation required to get mortgages approved. However, a lot of people are getting put into mortgages that just don't fit the client's suitability. The client's not suitable for those mortgages and don't fit the client's needs. So I just want to leave you guys with this saying, if you're not thinking about your clients tomorrow, today might be your last day, and we'll get into that. So this is a little bit about myself. I don't want to stay on here too long. Founder of Matrix Mortgage, just like Isaac said, director of Canadian Association of Private Lending, um, Matrix Cares Foundation, five-time broker of the year, uh, three-time top mortgage professional. I host a podcast called Crypto House, which talks about bringing the blockchain technology into the mortgage space, as well as the 2022 Scarborough Walk of Fame. Why private mortgages? Now, private mortgages are chosen by two individuals, the investors as well as the borrowers. And the investors like private mortgages because it's secured on Canadian real estate. You have an opportunity to invest in real estate without becoming a landlord. You're looking for higher yields, especially right now, there's a lot of high yields happening in private mortgages because like I said, there's just not a lot of financing options out there. Um, you could earn interest while being tax sheltered and there's great liquidity in those investments. So you have a monthly tangible cash flow. Those are some of the great benefits for investors. For borrowers, the stress test, I think right now the stress tests on some of the Altaid deals are around seven, eight percent. It's very challenging to get financing. Um, you may look for private financing for consolidation or construction loans. Uh, purchases where we look at the appraised value as opposed to the purchase price will help people get into to homes that they wouldn't get opportunities with traditional financing. Um, you know, consumer proposal spells or buyouts. Tax arrears is another big one. And um, if your first mortgage has a low interest rate, you may find convenience in getting a private mortgage. So it's a lot easier to qualify. You can rebuild your credit and improve your cash flow. Now there's some new education license standards coming into effect to help wean out some of the people that are kind of causing issues in the private lending space. The new mortgage agent license and enhanced mortgage agent and broker requirements are supporting some of the following outcomes. Education and competency requirements that better align with the activities of the mortgage market. There's a lot of people coming into the space for various reasons, and we have to make sure that we're providing proper education to our clients and our investor clients for the mortgages that we're placing. We wanna provide enhanced consumer protection for our borrowers. 
and our lender investors to receive appropriate levels of information and recommendations to make informed decisions for their mortgage and mortgage investments. This is paramount going forward. And I'm a firm believer that with the new guidelines, we're gonna be able to wean out some of the people that have been causing issues. In addition to that, enhance confidence in the mortgage broker industry as licensees prepare for their career in the mortgage brokering section. Some of the reasons why we are implementing some of these changes is because the errors and emissions claims have skyrocketed and title fraud, I know John will talk about that as well, have skyrocketed with mortgages in recent times. So as part of this, competency for regulated persons must maintain the skills, knowledge, aptitudes necessary for their business activities. People should decline to act when they're unable to provide products and services in accordance with this code. We wanna make sure that the mortgages that we provide are suitable and regulated persons and their entities take reasonable steps to present products and services that are suitable for their clients. And they must have a sound understanding of how the products and services match the disclosed circumstances of their clients. I see a lot of this day in and day out. Clients are put into mortgages. There's no sound exit other than the client losing their home. And I think this has to stop. And I know, John, you could, uh, Jimmy could attest to that as well, where a lot of people are getting mortgages that just don't fit their criteria. And that leads to disclosure. So there hasn't been a formal disclosure standard. Um, and I think what I'm trying to present today is some type of standard for that, where regulated persons and entities must fulfill the disclosure of material information to applicable parties in the transaction. And the disclosures must be meaningful and made in a honest and timely manner. Now, some of the things that we could do as mortgage professionals is provide enhanced risk mitigation. So my administration company, Capital, founded in 2017, is a licensed regulatory, is a licensed mortgage administration company with FISRA, and we provide alternative mortgage solutions and investments. Your role as a mortgage professional in lending is to mitigate against risk, validate mortgage or supporting documents, evaluate the collateral, ensure the mortgage suitability, and provide, provide a sound exit. Our function on the administration side, in association with our, our partners, such as our title insurance partners, our lawyers, um, our appraisers, we want to ensure that the property is available to secure. We provide title insurances. We ensure mortgage priority, whether it's first or second or third. Uh, we verify and search for liens and writs. Ensure that there's no tax deficiencies or arrears. Instruct the borrower for the mortgage to the borrower's lawyer. Registering the mortgage on title. Recovering the mortgage investment. And we mitigate against fraud. So it's an all-encompassing process that we work in hand in hand in conjunction with the mortgage broker and the investors and all of the parties involved. Some of the resources that I put together because I found that there's no standard documentation for private mortgages is I put together a group on LinkedIn which is called Private Lending Hub. It's a group of mortgage professionals all over Canada that go in there and they have, if they have questions about mortgages or documentation, they could ask those questions in there. We put together a private lender's survivor guide. That private lender's survivor guide has a, a lot of documentation, step-by-step -step processes for how to mitigate against risk, um, some questions to ask your potential clients. There's a mortgage intake form a summary email that's there. So in the event that you're talking to a client, 
what we encourage at Matrix is to reduce your conversations to writing immediately following that conversation. That copy of that summary email is there. A risk mitigation checklist, a client disclosure kit, as well as access to a CRM that you could follow up with your clients. So it's a lot different using a CRM for private mortgages than it would be for a traditional mortgage because there's a lot more steps involved with doing private mortgages. And that's pretty much it. And this is something I'm doing in the future, November 24th at the Canadian Mortgage Summit, talking about how to find a needle in the haystack. So I look forward to seeing you guys there. Thank you. I hope everybody is uh, is kicking in there. We got a great uh, group of people that are attending here and I appreciate it again. And uh, hi again to everyone at home. Uh, we are now gonna move on to our next presenter who I'm gonna make a nice introduction for. And it's Mr. John Ryder, who's the head of the CTIC Canada and the fraud division. That's what he's going to be talking about today. John leads the title division, retail and commercial for Chicago Title Insurance Company. He joined Chicago Title in July of 2015, bringing a wealth of experience in setting up businesses for expansive growth, improved customer service, and increased profitability. His goal is to make Chicago Title the number one title insurer in Canada, and he believes the key to achieving this is to work with people's strengths, motivating the team, and always going the extra mile for their customers. Without further ado, Mr. John Ryder. Thank you very much. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak today. And uh, today, oh, sorry, I get the uh, presentation pulled up as well, please. <clears throat> so today I'm gonna talk to you about fraud and fraud prevention. And I'm talking about identity fraud, uh, where it's actually real thieves out there stealing money and running away with it, uh, not income fraud, um, and how to protect you and your lenders uh, from this. Um, Halloween was yesterday, but I'm here today to scare the living hell out of you because uh, we are getting inundated with fraud and it is a problem that's plaguing the entire industry, but it's hitting the title insurance industry in particularly hard because we're paying for it. And so far we're able to pay that, uh, those losses, and, um, but there may come a time when we have to start pulling back. In fact, some of the title companies are already doing so in being able to provide the coverage. And if all the title companies pull out, and it's not a threat, we are doing everything we can to stay in fraud coverage. But if we do pull out, that means that it falls back to the industry to cover these losses themselves. So it falls to the lawyers, to the lenders, to the land titles office, to you folks. So please listen. <clears throat> So if I leave one message with you today, I would like it to be that ID is garbage. There is no such thing as valid ID in Canada anymore, probably the world, um, in, for, for, uh, in part because the fraudsters are so good at creating fake ID that even the police struggle to, uh, to be able to identify that it's fake, but also because we're now seeing frauds and we had a $4 million claim in BC where the woman had a valid Alberta driver's license with her face on it and all of the information of the homeowner on it. She, because the uh, resident was uh, offshore, um, she was able to get access to the house. The lender saw the property, look at my beautiful home. It's worth 12, 13 million. Surely you can give me a $3.8 million loan. They did, the money was gone. So, ID really is something that we can't rely on any longer. We're still doing it obviously in transactions, but even though I wanna scare the hell out of you, I do have a solution uh, at the end of the piece, which I think is pretty easy and straightforward. And I think it's the way the industry is going. So the one benefit, as I say, is that right now and forever, title insurance covers ID fraud. Um, it's one of the many reasons you wanna get title insurance. Um, but I did want to just take one minute to talk about title insurance specifically, and uh, you can time me if you, if you like. So back in the day, lawyers did a lot of searches. They did uh, uh, zoning, work orders, building permits, water, taxes, um, and they also got a survey. And at the end of the day, they provided a legal opinion to say, in my opinion, you've got good title. 
Uh, then title insurance came along in the 1990s and said, you don't have to do all those searches. So there's savings of time and money as, as a result of that. And title insurance is cheaper uh, and it will um, provide much better coverage than the standard opinion. So faster, better, cheaper uh, through title insurance. And should a loss arise from any of those searches not being done, title insurance, insurance covers the losses and that can relate to survey matters, your garage encroaching on the neighbor's property, uh, building and zoning issues, work orders, property tax and water arrears, um, and the big one over the last several years, which is mortgage fraud. Some of the things it doesn't cover is that it's not property insurance. It does not cover wear and tear on the home. It doesn't cover fences, boundary walls, fallen trees. Uh, it does not cover lost checks, errors in wire directions, and it doesn't cover things like septic systems or moving our interest costs for delays in closing. <laughs> so I'd like to play a short video of a news clip for someone who's experienced fraud. To believe that thieves could steal your home right out from under you, but it can happen. It's why when buying a house, experts say you should pay extra for title insurance. It's an added cost, but can protect you from fraud. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Michelle and Kenneth Brampton family says they were shocked when thieves stole their identities and took out a $100,000 mortgage on their home. They were forced to move out, and now they're fighting to get their house back. Nana Maller Shamagum and her husband feel like they're caught in a nightmare. They moved into this rented apartment after someone stole their identities and took out a $100,000 mortgage on their Brampton home. It caused them to lose their house and they have to pay back the money taken by the fraudsters. I never take anyone cents or anything. I never say. It's all the lawyers and paralegal Mr. did this fraud. They punish me in Canada. They make us refugee, you know. Title fraud is, it's, it's common. It's not as common as we think it is, but it's common enough where it obviously is affecting families. Samantha and Brooks with Mortgages of Canada says brokers and real estate lawyers recommend getting title insurance. She says having it would have protected the family from losing their home. Someone was actually able to create a fake identity and they actually secured a second mortgage on her property, which in turn she is now responsible for. As well as title fraud, title insurance also covers unknown title defects, existing liens against a property, encroachment issues, and errors in surveys. Title insurance costs about $300 to $500 and is often part of your legal closing costs, but it's not mandatory, so you can refuse it. Shamagum wishes she would have known how important it was to have. I want to tell the word, not only for us, everybody must to see, be careful for, you know, they, they make this kind of thing and steal the property. Her case remains under investigation and the family is hopeful they can get their house back. And title insurance is recommended for new home buyers, but even if your home is paid for, it's something you may want to consider. There are several companies that offer it, and once purchased, it's good for as long as you own the property. Well, the only thing as a lawyer that I can't agree with that poor woman is that she blamed the lawyers for it. Um, and while the lawyer may not have been directly involved uh, as a fraudster, oftentimes we are finding, unfortunately, that the lawyers are being duped. And we do have an example of uh, one lawyer who had 12 mortgage frauds in a two month period. And we had two of them. Um, and then we declined to uh, provide any additional coverage. So she didn't get title insurance on the other 10. So as a result, that falls, well, it falls on the law society uh, potentially to the extent of $1 million. But for the other nine mortgages, because um, they're, you know, assuming it's a million dollars each, um, they're going to be out of luck unless she's got very deep pockets or the lenders are going to be looking at other parties in the transaction to see who can uh, pick up the slack on that. So if you're working on a transaction, you ever see that title insurance is not involved, ask why not? Because there's lots of situations that we're running into now where we are seeing issues and we're saying either we will not touch this deal or we will insure it, but we are not giving you fraud coverage. And if you see that in a situation, you better look deep on it because we often get them coming back 
and saying, yeah, yeah, I, actually it was a fraud. Well, we kind of told you it was a fraud. Um, so uh, it, it's a big, big issue. So make sure that there is title insurance, all the transactions. So I just want to give you a couple of examples. So up until about three months ago, all the frauds we were seeing were, um, were uh, mortgage frauds. So someone puts a fake mortgage on a property, takes off with the money. In the last three months, they've started to slow down, but we've started to see vendor frauds where actual title to the property is being transferred away from the actual owner. And the new owner is buying the property from the fraudster and putting a mortgage on. So in that situation, one side or the other is gonna lose and it's gonna be ugly. Um, at Chicago Title in the last two years, we've had over a hundred fraud related claims. Um, as I say, most of them are on the mortgage side, but now we are getting these vendor frauds. So the first one relates to a homeowner who was offshore and rented the property out. Um, he gets a call from his real estate agent and says, why didn't you tell me you're selling your property? Why didn't you use me? And he said, because I didn't sell my property. And sure enough, he investigated and found out that the property had been sold to an innocent third party. And uh, now we're being asked to get title back for him. Um, another claim, uh, and as, as I say, we've gotten six or seven of those in the last uh, three months. And another one was a woman uh, was offshore. She, uh, so it's usually a rental scenario, um, but not always. Sometimes it's empty property. Um, but she uh, noticed that the common elements, uh, the common expenses weren't taken out of her account. And so she called the condo corporation and said, why aren't you taking my money? And they said, well, why would we? You don't own the condo anymore. So again, she's uh, in a bit of a mess. Uh, then there's Brad and Holly. So Brad and Holly had bought a house and um, owned it for several years. And then they had an opportunity to move, I think it was to England to uh, work for a few years. And so the first year they didn't rent the house. Um, but then when they came back at Christmas one year, they said, yeah, well, let's rent it out. Uh, so they rented out through a property manager, and within two months, the property has been sold out from under, under them. Uh, again, they don't realize this for some time. The new people move in. Um, they like the house, but they also wanted to renovate it. So they renovated Brad and Holly's house. They're now in there, and Brad and Holly are having to try and get their house back. Now, they likely will get the house back, but if they don't, and but it, it, they'll get it back, but the purchasers are gonna be scot-free, mm -hmm. or not scot-free, but they will have nothing if uh, there's not title insurance uh, on the transaction and the lender uh, will get nothing without title insurance. Um, but for Brad and Holly, if it is a situation where they can't recoup or get the property back, they paid $665,000 for the house and it was sold for $1.7 million. Um, now, under the title policy, there's actually an inflation um, clause. So when you uh, pay 665 for a policy, you actually get 1.3. So you get 100% um, uh, coverage in insurance, so 1.33 million in insurance. But they sold the house for 1.7. So there's a potential loss of $400,000. So what we did to address these kind of scenario is we put a credit endorsement called an increased policy amount. And again, you should be looking and asking about this for your clients because for an additional 10% of the uh, premium, which is a one-time premium, you pay it once for as long as you own the property, like they said on the, uh, on the piece, um, they get coverage for as, as much of, uh, as big as the value is on the, uh, on the property. <clears throat> So we've been doing a lot of work on behalf of the industry and behalf of ourselves, um, not just working to do presentations to folks like you, but also to hire a lobbyist and to work with our industry group, the Mortgage and Title Insurance Industry Association, uh, to try and go to various uh, regulators and entities to try and see if we can come up with a better way of addressing this. And we are asking in a number of uh, instances for an ID verification process different than just looking at ID. Um, and we think that the, there's a number of uh, groups uh, that are looking at uh, changing their approach as well, including the land titles office, because if we pull out of the coverage, then people will start making claims to the land titles compensation fund. So they're concerned, 
But we've also talked to, um, to FISRA, we talked to the Law Society, Land Titles, as I say, the Attorney General's Office, and we're trying to get them to make these changes, but we don't want a lot of regulation out of these changes because they're already been looking at it because they know that all these mortgages are happening. So what we're trying to say is there's a really simple and easy way for you to address this. And um, you should be looking at that and not looking at adding paperwork to everyone's uh, day throughout the whole process. And I'll explain that in just a bit. So I wanted to give you a, a bit of a story as well, which is really a, a plea to all of you folks that if you see something, say something. Um, we had a lawyer who called us and he said, um, I just had a couple in my office and they have the worst idea I've ever seen. And they're trying to borrow money and it's clearly a fraud. Um, he knew that we had good connections with the police because they're working very closely with us and letting us know who these fraud groups are. And so he said, uh, who are you dealing with there? So we put him in touch with the police. They waited outside of his office the next day. The couple comes in, signs up the documents. As they're leaving, the police pull them over and arrest them. Inside their car was not just the two of them and that fake ID, but the ringleader of the uh, crime ring, which was great, and about another 30, 35 pieces of ID for other people and other properties uh, around the city. So they were ready to have at on dozens more properties. So please let us know. We're happy to put you in touch with the police and with our private investor. Uh, yeah. investor. Hey, sorry, I'm just on a conference call. I, I hopped off. So I know I'm uh, low on time, so I'll just keep moving right along. So, because I want to get to the punchline. And the punchline really is, and where, as I say, I think the market's going, is that everyone eventually will have to, to do a transaction, do a client, a multi-factor ID verification uh, examination. Every time I pick up this bloody phone, it verifies who I am. So why can I go and borrow $2 million from somebody without truly verifying who I am? And pulling a piece of ID, as I've told you, out of my wallet is not verifying. So any of you folks who are using us uh, will know that there's a number of deals where we do have questions where you haven't acted for the party before, or there's other things that don't seem right, where we ask your clients to go through the ID verification service. And if you could start working with them to prepare them for it so that they understand what it is, it would be a huge help for us because uh, our poor team, they get people screaming at them literally saying what the hell is this why are you asking for all this information i don't even know who you are um and we have to say look if you want the money you have to do this i'm sorry but we need to make sure you are who you say you are and we have weeded out dozens of fraudsters because oftentimes when you ask they just disappear oh i didn't want that money anyway i'm busy or i got to travel there's always some excuse and they just go away um but the beauty of this thing this search service is it's 25 bucks per person. And it's basically for us stopped mortgage frauds. As I say, there's still a few seeping through, um, but now we've got these um, vendor frauds where we're um, dealing with um, frauds or selling houses. And we know that they're gonna find a new way into the industry some way. So that's what I, as I say, I think we're moving in the direction of these searches in any event, but just how it works. Cause I did it last month, it took me six minutes. And at first you're gonna say, well, I don't want people mucking around with this information, but um, you start by logging into your bank account. Now I'm not literally logging into my bank account, but I'm showing this Verif ID that I can log into my bank account, which likely means it's me. They don't see the information. And this has all been authorized by the big banks. Uh, they work with Verif ID. And uh, so now I've shown that I can get into my bank. Then I take a picture of myself, and I take my ID out and I take a picture of it and I have to send that in. They have some sort of biometrics that are looking at it to see, is it the same person? And yes, are there sometimes some that get failed because of that? Sure, I didn't have a beard before COVID, now I do. It still passed me, so obviously it works for a lot of people, but sometimes there are things that uh, will throw it off, but you do that, simple. At the same time with your uh, authorization, they're doing Equifax search. Again, they're not doing a credit search and the lenders have already done that. And that's not our business. We're not interested in that. But what they're doing is just making sure that the name you give matches up to the phone number you give, matches up to the uh, email address that you give and the home address that you give. And if there's any discrepancies, they let us know. 
And the last thing they do is they look at the cell phone numbers because cell phones are great uh, information sources because uh, if, if I'm suddenly doing, you know, if, if I'm only doing calls to Russia and I clearly don't have a Russian name or any Russian background, it's gonna be a strange thing. Or if it's a brand new phone that's only been around for two months, then there's gonna be issues. Um, so they're doing those four things. It's multi-factor. And as I say, it's weeded out a ton of the fraudsters. And how you can help, as I say again, is to prepare clients for this, because this is the direction the world is moving, for good or for bad. But it is going to reduce the amount of work you folks have to do. Because um, as I say, with, if ID is garbage, then why are you folks bothering to do it? Why don't we have this multi-factor service that everyone is using? And then that takes that whole part out of your process, simplifies your lives. So in conclusion, I hope you take away, as I say, that ID is garbage and that third-party multi-authentication is where it's at today. Um, we all work together to prevent fraud. We need to all work together. And it's not enough to say uh, the title companies will cover this because as I say, even if we're covering it, it's not like we immediately send a checkout and it causes you so much grief in your career that you don't want to go through it. Trust me. And that's all I got. So did I scare the hell out of you? <laughs> oh, I got some applause at least. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm sure all of us weren't prepared to be scared a day after Halloween, but, uh, you know, we're here and we're close enough. Um, on that note, it's actually it's actually interesting, you know, coming from the legal side and, and, and getting what John said, we actually get through uh, quite a few fraud situations when we're, we're dealing with transactions. And, you know, I think everybody has to be more aware as an industry on what we can do to, to, to make us better, because at the end of the day, we want to make sure we have those products available to us. And if we, uh, if we don't crack down in it on all ends, it's going to change the product that is, that is offered as, as, uh, as Jim was saying, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Nadia Condotta, who is a lawyer in our commercial and civil litigation department at Diamond and Diamond. Nadia has broad-based commercial and civil litigation practice that encompasses uh, anything from partnership disputes, shareholder disputes, insolvency, debt collection, real estate, and construction litigation. I've had the pleasure of working alongside with her. There's nothing like a presentation that uh, gets interrupted by, by Siri. Um, regardless, uh, I'd like to introduce Nadia Kondata again, who's going to be talking about uh, mortgage enforcement, how to speed up and slow things down and uh, a few t uh, tricks of the trade. And then we'll move on to our Q&A. Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about when things go wrong. Um, that is your mortgages need to go into enforcement. So we need to get your money back. All right. So what is default? It's when there's mispayments failure to insure, failure to pay taxes, maturity. Basically, it's a breach of any term of your mortgage commitment, which is why your commitments have to be solid at the beginning, because that's what we base your enforcement on. And so the any enforcement action is governed by the Mortgages Act. Mortgages Act says enforcement begins 15 days after default. And where do we begin? So depending on the circumstances of the default of the property, you, you have different places of where you start. If the property is owner, owner occupied, we start with the statement of claim. We go right into the action, right into the litigation, because starting with the statement of claim allows us to run the statement of claim and notice of sale at the same time. So you, the, you have a property that's only owner occupied, you know where the owner is, you start with the statement of claim. On the other side, you have a property that's vacant or you have a property that's leased or tenanted. You would start with the notice of sale because you can go in and take possession of that property right away. You serve your notice and your steps are a little bit different. Um, once your notice runs out, 35 days, you can go in and you can sell the property. Your notice of sale is 
the most important document in a mortgage enforcement action. It contains all the information that the mortgagor is going to need to pay that default off. If the notice of sale has a problem, then you're gonna have a problem with your enforcement action. And this is the document that has to be served on everybody. So as long as somebody has an interest in the property, they have to be served with this document. This is basically what it looks like. So on starting on the left-hand side here, you have the name of the mortgagees, the mortgagors, the legal description of the property, the uh, amounts that are gonna need to be paid in order to get that uh, mortgage dealt with. And then on the far side, you have a list of all the people that are, um, have an interest in the property. And you'll see that you have the spouse of both the named uh, lenders there. And we do that even if on the mortgage um, instrument, the borrowers are spouses of each other because what's happened in the past is you have somebody who gets divorced and you still have to name their spouse because now they've been remarried and that new spouse has an interest in the property. All right, so what is the statement of claim? It's the document that starts the lawsuit. It's issued in the jurisdiction of where the house is. A lot of times when we're looking at lawsuits, we look at cases and we say, okay, maybe we wanna issue in a different courthouse in a different jurisdiction because it's gonna move faster. We can't do that with mortgage enforcement because it has to be filed in the jurisdiction where the property is located, not the parties. And we're looking for monetary damages. We're looking for the principal interest and fees. That's all contained within the commitment. We're looking for possession of the property and we're looking for leave to issue a writ of seizure and sale. Now, traditionally, um, you look for the damages and possession in your statement of claim. Lately, we've been asking for leave to issue the writ of seizure and sale at the same time as the damages and the possession of the property because you get to skip a step at the end of the day. A judge has to tell you, yeah, you're allowed to issue this writ of seizure and sale. Some jurisdictions, they want you to have that order for possession already. Some will say, okay, we'll give you the, the leave to issue the writ at the time that we're gonna give you the judgment for possession. All right, and then, we have to look at the circumstances after the lawsuit is filed as well. In a lot of cases, and I know that you probably all know this, but in a lot of places you don't have an answer, you don't have a defense, and you move to get default judgment. Again, it depends on the jurisdiction of the court, it depends on the judge that you're gonna get, but basically you go present your case to the court and the judge is gonna give you an order for possession, and a lot of times now, because of COVID, this is done in writing. You get your judgment and you can go on and get your writ for the sheriff to go in and get the property. On the other side, and this is one of the ways that you would delay a power of sale action is to put in a statement of defense. So if your client is served with a notice of sale, a statement of claim, the easiest way to delay it is to put in a statement of defense because the whole process changes after that. You have to bring a motion for summary judgment. It automatically does not go in writing. It automatically has to go in front of a judge. Timelines are longer for a, a motion for summary judgment. In some cases, you can't get a date for a year. So that's the way that you delay. Um, on the other hand, to move it more quickly, you just basically <laughs> have to keep fighting with the court. And we have a clerk here who is very good at speaking to registrars and getting them to get us dates as quickly as possible. Again, the end of the day, you get your judgment because there's not a lot of a defense for a mortgage enforcement. You're not paying your mortgage. You've done something that is not 
conducive to your commitment or doesn't agree with your commitment, you're in default. So you get your writ of possession and the sheriff goes in, evicts the tenants or, or the owners from the property and you got a property manager to come in and change the locks and you can sell the property. So the, the last thing to, to, I guess, touch on is what if there isn't enough equity in the property? Every secured debt that is, in, is, is paid off in priority. So if you're the first person on the property, you're likely gonna get paid out. At the end of the day, some mortgagees aren't gonna get paid out because they're, they're listed subsequent, which is why, again, it's important at the beginning to make sure that there's, there's equity in the property. Yeah, we're going to do a question and uh, uh, an answer period now. And so if you have any questions, we can put it on the screen. I'm going to call up the appropriate presenter to, to discuss it. Um, one of the first things uh, people I'd like to bring up for the Q&A period actually is Daryl Singer, who's the head of our civil uh, litigation and real estate department as well, who works alongside Nadia in terms of mortgage enforcement and uh, commercial litigation. And he wanted just to expand on some ideas as well. No, you got to come up. I, I did this moment. I've gone from being Nadia's boss for six years to working alongside Nadia because Nadia is actually the one that does all the heavy lifting. So and she's doing a great job. So I wanted to expand on actually what Ergus said with respect to the fees. Most law firms, as, as, as you know, will take fees up front. With mortgage enforcement actions, our policy is that we'll take it at the end out of the out of the equity. If there's not enough equity, We'll work something out with you guys, with, with the lender. Um, we generally don't want the lender to be out of pocket at all with respect to the legal fees. Um, sometimes there's sufficient equity and I can charge a significant amount more than I might otherwise if nobody's complaining. And it certainly doesn't matter to you as the lender client because it's not coming out of your pocket. If there's not enough and we've had deals where there isn't enough, then we'll work a deal. Um, so again, you're not out of pocket typically. And I think that's something that we do that's different than, than a lot of firms do. Um, one, of the, one of the questions, sorry, Daryl, I'm gonna, you're gonna stay here, but one of, the questions, one of the questions we also had and I got before on the chat group is um, what happens in a, in a mortgage default proceeding where um, you, know, you end up selling the house and it sells for less than what the, uh, the mortgage is worth? Um, and, and to expand that, I guess, on a real estate transaction as well, sometimes people don't close because they don't have enough money to close. Yeah. So, I mean, we see lots of those cases um, that sort of goes in cycles, depending on the market. We saw a lot of that a couple of years ago um, when prices were going up like crazy. And what would happen is that person had sold person, you know, the vendor had sold six months later or three months later at the closing. They knew the price had gone up. So they refused to close because they knew they could sell for more. Now, of course, we're going to see things going in the opposite direction because people signed a, 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 a purchase, an APS and ultimately couldn't get the funding. Um, so that leads to litigation on both sides. Um, we act for both uh, the vendors and the purchasers on those deals. Typically, if you're the purchaser or sorry, if you're the vendor and the, the purchaser doesn't close and you're selling for less, um, it's relatively easy for us to get you a judgment on that. The law is abundantly clear uh, that if they don't close, that they're in breach and the courts have held over and over and over and over, despite very capable defenses brought by many lawyers on the other side, including us from time to time, the courts have repeatedly said, um, if, you sell, if you resell at a shortfall, um, the other side is liable. The predicament on that that we run into is getting you the judgment is easy, depending on what's happened with that other person. There may or not be, uh, may or may not be an ability to collect. If they've gone on and subsequently, uh, either they own their original house or they bought another house, there's usually a way we can chase them. If not, sometimes, uh, you know, unfortunately you're out of luck, but you can certainly pursue it and the courts will. It's one of those few cases other than a mortgage enforcement where we actually say as litigators, this is a slam dunk. And we never, ever, ever say that except for debt collection and these sorts of, uh, uh, when you're on the other side of a breach in the real estate transaction. So can I ask a question there? Yes, go ahead. 
So it's Michael here from America Designer Mortgages. I have uh, very, I'm, I'm actually acting on both sides here. Um, I'm mortgage broker and a realtor now. And I have a very much similar situation to what you're saying. Uh, there was a property that had sold back in February of 2022. Um, and it was supposed to close in September of 30th. Um, so let's just for simplicity's sake, it's $1.5 million that we basically uh, uh, sold the property to the buyer. Buyer um, wasn't capable of closing the deal on September 30th. Um, so now the property got relisted. Now uh, we have a feeling that uh, it's not going to sell for more than $1.2 million. Now the the, the buyer is in breach. The seller um, hasn't finalized the transaction, but let's say there's a $300,000 shortfall here. Uh, the lit litigation is going to come in place and you know, following the closing of this transaction once it sells to the other buyer. Uh, now, so let's say that $300,000 is in stake and, and uh, the buyer, the previous buyer does not have any assets um, and uh, let's say we're going to go to court and there'll be a judgment against uh, that $300,000 shortfall. How, e how easy is it to collect those monies and what are the procedures on that? Okay, so for those who didn't hear, if I can summarize, the question was essentially, you get your judgment on the shortfall, but that person doesn't own another property. They don't have any obvious assets. How do you collect? And the answer is, we, we often dig a little deeper. Um, they may have other assets that aren't readily apparent when you do a title search, often we'll hire. Uh, we've got some very good private investigators who have access to uh, databases that, that none of us have access to. And sometimes we're surprised when we come up with something that we can pursue. Often there's an asset that's been transferred to somebody else's name, so it doesn't show up under their name. Um, and we can then pursue that perhaps under something called the fraudulent conveyance action. Um, if that person doesn't have any assets, but they have a decent job, uh, we can pursue them that way. So there are a number of avenues that we can take, um, but those are certainly things that we would we would have to pursue. And, and, and it really is circumstantial depending on the individual, the amount of money involved uh, and what we find, what information we have. So, so let's just say, uh, to throw in the ranch into this one a little bit. Uh, so originally that property was purchased under the husband's name um, back in February. And then uh, I think by... Uh, August or September, they've uh, they try to change it to the wife, which you know basically the yeah. wife. Sorry, Michael. Is taking over the, yeah. Sorry, I, I I can't because we're in a I can't answer questions about specifics. I can only give it sort of general answers. But I'm certainly, if you want to call Isaac or Nadia or I at some point later this week, we're happy to talk to you about it. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's tough to get into specifics as we, you know a lot of times we got to look into the file and we want to also. Um, you know, get, uh, can you send your contact? Yes, of course, Michael, we will we'll definitely yeah, yeah, send our please. contact info for sure. So one of the other questions I had, and this one is going to be for uh, uh, Sean, and Sean, maybe you wanna, wanna come up here. Um, so the the question that, that I got was, in, when you're underwriting a, a file for a mortgage in this in this market, what differences are you looking at in terms of underwriting to kind of protect the client going forward into the future? Um, the exit strategy is, is paramount in any type of uh, private mortgage financing. Um, you want to make sure that, like I said in the presentation, that their suitability um, is addressed, uh, making sure that you know they have the ability to repay, making sure that you know, you're consolidating the debts, you're putting them in a better financial situation, and you're making sure that they have the ability to, you know, migrate out of a private mortgage. I think a lot of times people get stuck in private mortgages, and there's just no way to get out of it. Right now, we're in a declining market. So 80% mortgages a year ago or 85 or 90 today. Um, so those are some of the things that you want to take a look at with regards to you know, the types of deals that you're doing. You don't want to put people into 85, 90s and there's no exit strategy, right? So I think um, just being top of mind and, and understanding that part of it is paramount to any type of uh, private mortgage transaction. Thank you.
No, I do think it's it's going to expand. I mean, Ontario, as I said, virtually every deal is now title insured, but it's not true across the country. And um, at West in particular, uh, more and more lenders are insisting on it uh, to provide them with the protection. And uh, as I said earlier, the owner and lender policies are different policies. You have to buy both to get coverage for the owner as well as for the lender. And I think there's going to be a lot more upselling to the uh, owner's policies or of the owner's policies because it's a buy one, get one for 10%, basically. So people are crazy not to. Um, it really is the cheapest and best insurance you'll ever buy because of that one-time premium and protecting your entire ownership of the property. So I just think it's crazy when people don't take advantage of, uh, of uh, taking the owner's policy. The thing I'd say, uh, if, if any of you don't have a mortgage at all on your homes, or if you have parents who don't have mortgages, these fraudsters are also doing title searches, looking for properties with new mortgages. But if you have parents who spend, you know, three or four months of the year down in Florida, they may come back and find that their house has been sold. So for the cost of the insurance, it's nominal uh, and you're crazy not to have it on your property. I'm just gonna scroll through the chat quickly to see if there's something that I missed. Um, so I had one question, are legal fees based on the outstanding debt to be collected or is it a percentage of the collection amount or a flat fee? So we work at every situation a little bit differently. Normally where it's an hourly rate or block fee that we would charge on a, on a uh, power of sale proceeding. But depending on the situation, we have to talk to the client or, or you know, whoever we're representing and figuring out the best way that would work for that particular situation. And I'm just going to leave the chat open for a few more minutes. I don't see anything else in terms of questions. If anyone has, um, obviously, like I said before, I'm happy to send the presentation in contact. Would you register a mortgage against your parents' debt-free house without actual advance made in order to ward off fraudsters? I already have Daryl jumping out of his seat to answer this one, so I'll... Uh, um, but by the way, I'm just going to repeat it because Daryl was already was already talking. So <laughs> the question is, would you register a mortgage against your parents' debt-free house without actual advance made in order to ward off fraudsters? Well, I was just going to say a question for those who don't know is from Terry Wallman. Terry, you know the answer better than we do. So <laughs> <laughs> I think Terry's asking us just to mess with us. So uh, yeah, <laughs> he says, yes, I do. So does everyone else want to know the answer? What was the question again? Let's go back. Would you register a, uh, would you register a mortgage on your parents' home? But I register a mortgage. Well, no, it wouldn't be a legitimate mortgage. I mean, that's... But, but, that, but people do it, sure. People do it. Yes. yes. I, I don't know that I can advise against it or, or for it, or, or I can advise for it, but I'm going to let... Yeah, you go ahead. Well, I think you can, I'd, I'd be reluctant to advise simply because it wouldn't be a legitimate. We have seen people do it, and we've seen those mortgages get discharged. So it doesn't work. If you can fr fake a mortgage, you can fake a discharge, and then um, you move forward. And if, if your parents don't have title insurance, they're in the same boat. Uh, I know this wasn't meant to be a title insurance sales. But it's a good but pitch. It's, but it's, it's a good it's, pitch. Uh, it, you're crazy not to have it because they play around and they're looking at the titles and they do this kind of stuff. It doesn't matter what you and, do. And there's a huge advantage, by the way, to having title insurance that we, we haven't mentioned. Yeah, you can sell, excellent. So I'm going to sell for <laughs> you, actually. Well, and for me, potentially. But uh, for example, if, if, if you have some fraud against your title and you don't have the title insurance, um, then you're paying me directly out of your pocket to do the litigation. If you got title insurance, Chicago title is going to pay me to do the to do the litigation, right? So aside from the fact that you're protected from an insurance perspective, you're also going to save those legal fees, which could be tens of thousands of dollars, because you've got the insurance company in your corner that's handling that for you. That's fair to say, Tim? Perfect. Okay. We need to defend it, so. Sorry. All right. Um... And I'm just going to just scroll up again one more time. Oh, we had a question in, in the audience here, and I'll repeat it. So, what happens to those 12 mortgage cases where the mortgage didn't get, I'm assuming the mortgage got title insurance in all 12 cases? No, she didn't. She only got it on 10, on two. The other 10 don't have insurance. So, she's getting sued like crazy. 
Oh, I was really impressed that she got 12 and you guys said this is too much. No, no, the other 10, she did not get title insurance at all. Oh, that's so that's what I'm saying. If you see a deal where someone's saying you don't need title insurance, um, unless it's like you're actually loaning to your own grandmother. Um, uh, 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 oh, sorry, the question was, did the woman, uh, the lawyer who had 12 mortgage frauds in a row, did she not title insure all of them? Well, she didn't. She only title insured the first two. The other 10 were not, not title insured. And so those lenders are completely exposed. As I say, they'll go to the law society, um, but at the law society, they have to prove that she didn't meet the standard of practice, which I think is a pretty easy argument. I would have thought I'm not a litigator, but if she's had 12 in a row, um, she's clearly not, she's missing something. Um, so uh, yeah, th there was 10 lenders who were just completely exposed because title insurance is not there. So. Was, was the second part of the All right. Um, so it seems like that's it. Oh, here we go. So is there a statute of limitation when it comes to title insurance? I'm thinking of estate properties when a title was a transfer occurred in years prior. And the second question, can we suggest our realtor partners to do as, what can we suggest to our realtor partners to do as pra best practice in falling to closing a deal? Um, this can go either way. Uh, John, do you wanna, do you wanna ask this? Cause uh, uh, it comes to a title insurance or do you want uh, Daryl? Yeah, maybe Daryl. Uh... No, I, okay, I, <laughs> I thought well, the first part is a question for Jim and the second is a question for Don. Yeah, I, I knew I'd get asked a question. I don't specifically know the answer to. I've only been in the business for uh, 19 years, so I'm, I'm still learning. But um, yeah, I don't know. I, I believe that the estate, uh, it goes with the estate because it's the estate is the person. So as long as it's that person, then uh, the title insurance uh, uh, goes with. Um, I think it is, I think, I read the question, okay. might be saying, well, or I'll say the different if somebody, if it's an old property that doesn't have title insurance, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a existing homeowner policy will sell. You have to talk to your lawyer. They do the title search uh, and check the taxes, make sure everything's okay, and then we uh, issue the policy. But it's a clean and easy uh, uh, easy approach to it. Um, so yeah, we're happy to uh, sell a policy. You get any time. Uh, I mean, obviously, you're you're not going to get coverage for building permits or survey issues that you know. Not, you can't be buying title insurance knowing there's a problem, but for the fraud coverage and as long as you didn't know about anything else, you're covered. I have a question, John. Would, uh, would the owner title insurance provide a refinance? Once the, it, it applies the, to the mortgage that's on title. So if there's an assignment of the mortgage, um, a syndication of the mortgage, anything to that mortgage is done selling interest, the new lender still has the title insurance. If that mortgage is discharged and new one goes on, then it's a new policy you have to buy. The lender policy, how about the homeowner policy? No, the homeowner policy just stays. As long as that person owns that home, they've got the coverage uh, until that. They're, they're two separate policies, not linked together. They're just usually bought at the same time. Okay. Well, would it make sense in the household to be to have policy policy? I mean, I guess there's benefits because if there's a problem and the lender makes a bills after the owner, they can turn. Oh, sorry. Is there any benefit for the owner to have to make sure that the lender has a policy? Well, yeah. So as a homeowner, they definitely should get because of the fraud issues. Um, and sure they should make sure that their lender has it too but see they don't get it the lender gets the lender policy the owner gets the owner policy so if the lender has it and if there's some recourse they want to take against the owner then at least the title insurer is there to uh so i guess if there, there would be scenarios where the, the property is underwater the lender's coming back and there's a title problem so they're suing the um, individual directly because there's not enough money in the property. So there would be potential benefits uh, there as well. One more question. So how often would someone at a lawyer's office, would a lawyer 
suggest a client? How often is just to buy both policies? In Ontario, uh, virtually 100%. Um, in, in BC, uh, 2%. In Quebec, 3%. Um, but it's changing very rapidly because, especially in places like Alberta, where they're now kicking documents out and it's a four month registration gap um, before you actually own the, the property or have the mortgage on the property, um, they're kicking the documents out. So if you haven't bought a policy for the owner and the owner's interest is gone, the lawyers are going to get sued like crazy. So, but in Ontario, it's, it's virtually all the time. But as I say, because this woman was getting defrauded, and she couldn't get title insurance and the lender still want to do the deals. She, well, in my personal opinion, she didn't properly advise them, but um, they lost out. And John, stay up here because I think, and it goes back, I think we, we talked about it before, but I just want to, again, when refinancing, if an owner policy was not done at the purchase, can it be purchased at the time of refinance? Yes, it's the existing homeowner policy. Um, so just to have them ask, for that, it's actually the best time, but you don't even have to have it in conjunction with a refinance. You just own a property without a mortgage or just want to have title insurance on your pro existing properties. And keep in mind, if you have multiple properties, you can't be in both at the same time. So if you're not at the cottage, um, it could be sold out from under you if it's closed for the winter. Um, or if you're at the cottage all summer, the house could be, someone could be mucking around with the house. So um, buy title insurance and you can buy, uh, basically you can buy either policy either time, as long as you're not doing it to deal with a problem that you know about. Like, you know, my neighbors just told me my garage is half on his property. Oh, I better buy title insurance. But well, we're obviously not gonna pay that, so. And, and just by the way, just the simplest form, um, and it happened to my neighbor actually, who um, bought his house um, with a deck. And uh, when, he, when he bought his house, he had, title insurance and he didn't really understand what he was buying but his lawyer said no get title insurance you never know and turns out that the deck didn't have a permit so you know when he said what do i do i said did you do you check if you have title insurance if you had title insurance when you bought the home and it was you know two years earlier uh then they'll cover you and and they did it was just you know that's that's part of title because again that's one of those things that the permits would have been into the system and it wasn't done properly and and, and it was paid out and i can tell you that you know, on, on John's claims, I've seen, I've seen Chicago actually, you know, when it's a legitimate claim and it's, you know, it's black and white, the, the claims get that paid out. So it's, it's good. And like you said before, you know, when we see from a legal side, almost every transaction we do has title insurance because it also benefits all parties involved, right? It protects, it protects all the parties in some significant way from different angles. So I think that's important. Uh, any other questions uh, from the live audience or online? Now is your chance. Nope. Okay, perfect. So we're going to send the, the recording to all our participants and all of our contacts. So if you want to ask us questions uh, privately, you're more than welcome. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and being with us today online and in person. Uh, I hope you learned something today and got to see some, some familiar faces. And we look forward to doing this again. Thank you.